Good afternoon. Welcome to worship this Ask Wednesday. Today we want to focus our attention on the final steps of Jesus. We'll be taking a look at his final steps during the entire course of Lent. And tonight we take a look at his final steps leading to the empty tomb. May God bless your worship today. We stand at this time to continue with the responsive reading from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you, O God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Brothers and sisters, in Christ, God created us to know joy in fellowship with him, to love all people, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God, in his mercy, has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from lo the love of God and neighbor. Let us confess our sins and ask our Father for forgiveness and commit ourselves to this struggle. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you, to one another, that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us, we have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have placed our wants before your will. We have gratified the desires of our sinful nature. We have merited your punishment now and forever. Have mercy on us, Lord. 
We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people, our anger when our selfish aims are denied, and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O Lord, our love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, Lord, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. Forgive us, Lord, for what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will. Forgive us, Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. You may be seated at this time. It's also at this time where, if you would like, you can come forward for the imposition of ashes, lighting up in two separate lines. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. For dust you are. Dust you are, dust you shall return. Dust you are, dust you shall return. Dust you are, and dust you shall return. For dust you are, dust you shall return. Dust you are, dust you shall return. Dust you are, dust you shall return. For dust you are, dust you shall return. For dust you are, dust you shall return. For dust you are. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. Please stand. Accomplish in us, Lord, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and suffering of your Son, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. He sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith, and at the last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, you never despise what you have made and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from Isaiah chapter 59. In these words, our almighty God promises to send a redeemer to all those who repent and look for that redeemer. For our offenses are many in your sight and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us and we acknowledge our iniquities. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance, and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies, and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood, and the breath of the Lord that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We we sing him 535.
Our epistle reading for this afternoon is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthian believers. There we read from chapter, chapter 7. Here, God tells us about the importance of godly sorrow over sin. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us instructions for the way that we live our daily lives as Christians. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for him, 840.
temptation. Amen. Amen. My fellow followers of our Savior to the cross. But we just say, all men living are but mortal. Did you think about that? Did you think about the fact that one day you're going to die? So how about this? What if you knew the exact day, the exact time, and the exact cause of your death? Would you want that? Just think about if you had that kind of knowledge. If you knew the exact day of your death, the exact time, and the exact way in which you were going to die. Imagine if you knew that you were going to be 104 years old. That was rather interesting when I preached this sermon this morning in a front bunch of a front of 70 and 80 year olds in a senior living facility. They all chuckled at that. But imagine if you knew that you were going to live to be 104 years old and that you would die at 2.46 p.m. on a bright sunny summer Thursday. You know what the temptation would be, right? Live 103 years and however many days and then about a week before that time was going to come, okay, I better get my house in order. How about instead of having that kind of knowledge, you knew that you were going to die of a long and slow torturous death as you went through radiation and chemotherapy and dealt with cancer. And you knew that you were going to be a burden to your friends and loved ones. I'm guessing that kind of knowledge wouldn't be quite so joyful, but it would probably put us into a little bit of a depression and despair. I will tell you personally, I'm glad that I have no idea when my Savior is going to call me home. But talking about that whole idea of death and our end, let's think about it this afternoon from the perspective of our Savior. Jesus did know exactly how he was going to die, what day it was going to be, and the way it was going to happen. Think about what else Jesus knew. He knew that after he lived 33 years, he was going to be falsely accused, he was going to be ripped, he was going to be spit on, he was going to be mocked. And then he knew the way that he was going to die. A painful, torturous death on a cross. <laughs> and nothing stopped him from facing that. He willingly and gladly took those final steps, motivated by love for you, love for me, and love for all people. His final steps is going to be the theme that we're going to follow this year in our midweek Lenten worship. We're going to see a number of very interesting places to which our Savior's final steps led him as he ultimately ended up on the cross. This afternoon, we're going to look at how his final steps led him to a tomb, but it's not the tomb that you and I would think about when we first hear that. We're going to go with our Savior on what is really the first step of those final steps. As his steps led him to stand in front of the tomb of his dear friend, Lazarus. I guess you probably remember that story. Jesus' dear friends, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. So that's where we're going to go this afternoon, and I'm going to reference at various times portions of that account from 
John chapter 11. And as we go with our Savior, the final steps led him to that tomb. We're going to see that he went to a tomb that was emptied for their faith, for your faith, and mine. And we're going to see a tomb that was emptied to accomplish God's plan of salvation. I just referenced how Jesus knew the little village of Bethany rather well. The Bible tells us how he had been there numerous times to spend time in the home of his dear friend, the sister Mary and Martha, we know that story well, and their brother Lazarus. What we maybe don't so quickly remember is that Bethany was also the headquarters of another group of people who were not so welcoming and loving to Jesus. Think about what you remember when you hear the chief priests, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Remember how at many times during his three-year earthly ministry, they were nothing but thorns in Jesus' side, how they were constantly questioning him, constantly harassing him, and always trying to find something that they could say, oh, he's not the perfect son of God. So as Jesus went to Bethany, as recorded in John chapter 11, he knew that the time had come for him to finally make that journey to the cross. John chapter 11 puts us just a few days before the start of that first Holy Week. And it begins by Martha sending a message to Jesus. My brother Lazarus is sick. Do you remember what Jesus did that was rather intriguing in response to that message? We might think when Jesus heard that his dear friend was sick, he's going to go rushing out there and do as he had done with so many other people. Heal them of their sickness and restore him to good health. But John records for us in John chapter 11 that Jesus' disciples were puzzled. Jesus waited two days after he heard that Lazarus was sick. And they said, Jesus, why are you waiting? And he gave them the seemingly ambiguous answer so that the Son of Man may be glorified. And that's only after Jesus hears that Lazarus has died that Jesus decides that it's probably time to get to Bethany. And he says, Lazarus is only sleeping. So Jesus goes to Bethany. He's met by a understandably grieving Mary and Martha. And they ask him what seems to be the obvious question. Lord, why didn't you come sooner? And then Jesus starts to put things into motion. Strengthen their faith, your faith, and my faith. The next thing that we're going to hear from John chapter 11 are words that we well might anticipate hearing a little over six weeks from now when the solemn time of Lent ends and we get to Easter Sunday. Now this is not a spoiler alert for Easter Sunday. It's simply laying the groundwork for the rest of Lent. John 11, 24 and 25 Jesus says to his sister Mary and Martha, to his disciples and to those who were gathered around, I am the resurrection and the life. 
whoever believes in me will never die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked this very probing question. Do you believe this? A question for Mary and Martha to consider. A question for his disciples to consider. A question for you and me to consider. And then Jesus proceeds to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus accomplished what he had just said. Do you believe this? Mary and Martha obviously understood. As I was putting this all together, it was brought to my attention a perspective that I'll be honest with you, I have never thought about from that story before. Think about where Lazarus' faith was after Jesus had raised him from the dead. You think he was probably a rather incredibly thankful man? You think he probably understood maybe even more than you and I ever do? Those familiar words from Romans 8, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Man, if God carried that out in Lazarus' life. Remember what we have seen in Jesus' disciples up to this point in his three-year earthly ministry. And then also think about what we're going to hear again, hear about them over the coming weeks. We're going to hear about disciples who denied their Savior. We're going to hear that they all turned and fled. And Jesus had just demonstrated to them his power over death. But that miracle was not just done to give assurance to Mary and Martha. It was not just to give Lazarus a new lease on life. It was not just done to strengthen the faith of his disciples, to once again equip them for what they would see in the coming days. Jesus also did that miracle. For you, for me, and for all children of God. So that even though we don't know exactly when we're going to die, we don't have to be afraid of death. That we can say confidently along with the Apostle Paul, and again, words that we would probably anticipate hearing on Easter Sunday, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your state? Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think you start to understand now why Jesus let those days pass, why he let Lazarus pass away, and why he went to that tomb. For Mary and Martha, for his disciples, and for you and me. What we probably don't think about is that this was also part of bringing to completion God's plan of salvation. If you read in John chapter 11, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John puts in pretty clear detail the reaction of those other people from Bethlehem. The chief priests, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law. And they were not happy. Remember all the way along, the Gospels tell us how the chief priests and the teachers were trying to put a plan together so that they could get rid of Jesus because they were annoyed by his teaching. After Lazarus is raised from the dead, John tells us very clearly they were infuriated and determined all the more to put him to death. While everybody else was comforted and reassured by the raising of Lazarus from the dead, they were infuriated. 
There's one other thing that I learned in the process of putting this whole sermon together. And, and it explains in very clear detail why Jesus waited for Lazarus to die and then waited a little bit longer to go to battle. Jesus knew what was a common understanding among the Jewish people at that time. And that was this. The Jewish belief at that time was that after a person died, the soul lingered around the body for up to three days, and on the fourth day it was taken to heaven and could not be raised back to life until Jesus came back. Except for when Jesus is there as the Son of God. Jesus knew that he was going to shatter the idea that the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and all of his fellow, fellow Jewish people held, that there was no way at all that a person whose soul had been out of their body for four days could be raised back to life. And Jesus did it. He raised Lazarus from the dead after his soul had been out of his body for four days. Just think of the way that fueled the anger and hatred of the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law. It's like he stuck his finger in their eye and said, I'm going to show you exactly what I can do. And John tells us that that was really the ultimate thing that led the chief priest, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law to ultimately crucify Jesus. But it ultimately crucified Jesus. The chief priests, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law were helping bring to completion God's plan of salvation. They brought to completion God's plan of salvation because that fulfilled everything that had been said that the Son of Man would die and on the third day rise again, and that forgiveness of sins and salvation would be made available to all people. Jesus went to that tomb because he knew as true God all of that was going to happen. Again, we just sang, no. all men living are the poor. And none of us has any idea at all what day, what time, or exactly what cause is going to bring our human mortality no. to him. But because Jesus cared enough to go to the grave of his friend Lazarus and raise him from the dead after his soul had been gone for four days, you and I don't have to be afraid to die. We know that our Savior will raise us from the dead when he returns. And we can also thank God that in so doing, he made sure that that plan of salvation that had been so craft, carefully crafted from eternity would be brought to its perfect completion for our eternal good. Thank you, Jesus, for taking those final steps for our eternal salvation. Amen. Please stand.
We continue now with the responsive prayer of the church that's printed in your service folders. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Let us pray for the people of God in Christ Jesus that through repentance and faith in the gospel, they may remain secure in your love. Lord God, gracious Father, we thank you for setting your son's sacrifice between us and sin's reward. By your spirit, work in us through the gospel. Give us repentant hearts, make our faith firm in Christ, and enliven us to serve you faithfully. Have mercy upon us, Lord, according to your unfailing love. Lord God, Almighty Father, renew your church throughout the world that it may constantly look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Bless us with faithful ministers who always proclaim Christ's cross and resurrection for the salvation of the world. Have mercy upon us, Lord, according to your unfailing love. Lord God, loving Father, in your mercy you abundantly supply our needs of body and soul. Create in us the mind of Christ, that in humility and generosity, considering not only our own interests, but also the interests of others, we may be merciful to those in need. Direct our efforts to help poor, lonely, and troubled, and ill people. Have mercy upon us, Lord, according to your unfailing love. Lord God, Heavenly Father, comfort all who are mourning the death of people they loved. Lift their eyes to the cross where your son defeated death and to the empty tomb where he assured us that we will live with him forever. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Have mercy upon us, Lord, according to your unfailing love. Lord God, Heavenly Father, look with favor upon all sick, injured, recovering, and recovering people. If it be your will, deliver them from their infirmities. Let them hear of your unfailing love. Have mercy upon us, Lord, according to your unfailing love. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Lord God, eternal Father, we praise you that you have delivered the Christians, the Christian souls who have gone before us from this world of dust and ashes to paradise. As their prayers continually ascend before your throne, join our prayers to theirs as fragrant incense. Hear us for the sake of him who was crucified for us and always intercedes on our behalf. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This time we have an opportunity to worship our Savior with our offerings. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. 
Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in the sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will come, will welcome us into his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May be seated for our final hymn, 851.